Dr. Atchison again, and we are talking still about Chapter 7, Perception, Promotion, and Perceived Action. Um, this time we're going to be talking about the perceptual organization um, that we get from motion. So this is going to be similar to some of the material that we learned in Chapter 4 um, when we were talking about motion as a salient um, for kind of grouping objects and determining objects in finger-to-ground um, situations. One of the ways that we do this is apparent motion. Um, apparent motion is when things look like they're moving um, because the retinal image is changing, um, but they don't, aren't actually moving. One of the best ways that we, um, one of the one ways that people are most familiar with how this works um, are these flip book images where you have a book that's, um, a, again, a series of different pictures and you, you flip through the book really quickly and it looks like there's motion. So here's a really good example of one of those that I found. So um, again, these are just still images, um, but when they're moving, um, it kind of gives that object that the object's moving because the retinal images are changing. Um, and this is a, a really intricate um, version um, of this. Um, there's also a launch pad um, activity that will walk you through this um, so that you can really kind of see how this works in more basic situations, um, not just, not intricate um, but pretty cool um, demonstrations like this one. Um, so again, there is that launch pad assignment on perceptual um, grouping based on apparent motion. Um, and again, apparent motions when the visual stimuli are presented at different locations in a sequential manner. Um, in the case of the flip books, it was done very, very rapidly um, by just kind of flipping through those pages. And then apparent motion really plays a key role in how we group information. Um, and it's an important link to see how those retinal images of an object that appear in two different locations, or in the case of these flip books, many different locations at different times, really give that perception of motion. So again, do that launch pad activity. It is for a participation grade. Um, another way that we do this um, is, again, we talked about the camouflage um, in terms of determining the object from its background, kind of those figure-to-ground organizations. Um, and this video kind of really shows you how movement is important in that. Um, so there's a flounder here, and you don't really see it until he starts moving. Um, and the more he moves, the easier it is to see this flounder. Um, again, this is that, um, that figure-to-ground organization um, that we're getting from motion, as motion is an important way to determine um, what's figure and what's ground. Especially in the case of this flounder, you, if you don't know he's there, you really can't see him until he moves because he is so well camouflaged. Um, so again, this movement allows us to see boundaries or edges that separate the objects. So we can see the flounder compared to that sandy bottom when there's movement. Um, so this influence of movement is really very important um, category, uh, category in that figure to ground organization. Another way we test this is random dot um, kinematograms. Um, and these are used by researchers to really investigate how motion um, really works. So we don't, we have these real life examples such as the flounder, um, but you know, we're researchers, so we want a little bit more <laughs> control in the situation. Um, and these really allow researchers more control so that they can look at how um, we're doing this, how we're using motion um, to separate the figure from the ground. And these really involve random black and white dots, and your book has um, an image of this figure 713, 713. Um, and it's again, it's kind of perceived motion within these random dots. So um, here's a video I found um, of them. The background of this guy's desk is, <laughs> is not what I would expect for someone filming a video, um, but nonetheless, you can see um, the, um, how these random dot kinematograms work. So here you see a circle on that trial, and here's another trial, you see the circle on the left, um, and then on another trial, the circle's still on the left. You can see this, and again, we're using this as, there is, we're saying there's an object there because of that swirling of those dots compared to just these random dots. Um, so again, this is one of the ways that they test us um, to see kind of where there's motion um, and to use motion as a way to determine figure ground organization. 
And the last one that we're going to talk about is biological motion um, from point light displays. Um, so you and I will perceive this as a person walking. Um, you don't see a person at all. <laughs> you just see dots. Um, but again, um, we're going to perceive this as a person um, because we're used to this type of movement. Um, and so again, this biological mov movement can be really inferred um, um, information about the organism based on how it's moving. Um, so there's a launch pad activity on this that's really good. You can kind of manipulate the different um, ways that they can mess with the dots. Um, and you can kind of change different um, characteristics um, of the walker um, based on the differences in how close the dots are, the angles of the dots, um, all of those different things. We're better at this the more dots we have. If we had just have dots um, in a couple of places, um, it would have been a lot harder to see. The more dots we have, the easier this is to see. Um, these dots are important where they're placed. You can't just put them anywhere. Um, you really want them on the joints because that's um, where we can kind of, again, infer that motion. Um, and it really depends on kind of um, this coordinated timing of the points motion. So again, this is the information that we're getting based on this timing, based on our top-down processing of what we know um, this biological movement looks like. Um, and this area of the brain is really, um, we see that the um, STSP, um, the superior temporal sulcus, um, is really um, in the, post sorry, the posterior superior temporal sulcus um, is really involved with this biological motion. Um, as opposed to just area MT, um, we have again another module um, that we see is influential here. So that ends our second video um, talking about perceiving motion. Thanks.